Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. I wanna do a check, make sure we're ready to go here. Welcome everybody. I'm glad you could make it. My name is Mike North. I'm the campus dean for the Strawberry Plains campus for Pellissippi State. And uh, I just wanted to welcome everyone to the inaugural Appalachia Speaks Symposium, uh, discovering and weaving stories of self and place in our changing world. We are so happy to be here today as part of the first programming event for the Pellissippi Libraries and Strawberry Plains Campus Appalachian Heritage Project. It's supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, the Appalachian Heritage Project was created in conjunction with a grant to renovate a space at the Strawberry Plains Campus for a very much needed uh, library that will both house Pellissippi's Appalachian collection of books and videos and serve as a venue for quarterly programming and exhibits to support the humanities uh, education at Pellissippi. This project was first conceived by librarian Susan Martell. So congrats to Susan, uh, who came to Pellissippi from outside of Tennessee, but who continually noted the local library staff's love of all things Appalachian and their strong identification with the history and culture of the area and its people. Our very unique region deserves attention and exploration of the Appalachian Heritage Project. And it will work to highlight, preserve, and promote the celebration and study of our area for our students, faculty, staff, and community. With that in mind, it seems natural that we would begin our programming with a discussion about Appalachian stories and how the stories we and others uh, tell about us affect how we see our place in the world. I am very pleased to introduce to you our panelists today. Guest speaker, Dr. Chris Green, as well as our own associate professors of English, Candace Dendy and Patty Ireland. Let me give you a brief overview of each. Dr. Chris Green is the director of the Loyal Jones Appalachian Center at Berea College in Berea, Kentucky. He's also the chair of the Appalachian Studies Department at Berea, as well as an associate professor of Appalachian Studies. Green is author of The Social Life of Poetry, Appalachia, Race and Radical Modernism, and several books of poems, and has edited Cole, a poetry anthology. For the last three decades, he has dedicated his work to helping Appalachians create and circulate their stories via creative writing, documentaries, music, children's books, and other mediums. Professor Candace Dendy. Candace Dendy is an associate professor of reading in the English department of Pellissippi State Community College. She's in her 21st year with us and recently donned the hat of coordinator for the Reading 0900 and College 1500 courses. Professor Dendy is the pastor of Uchi Chapel, AME Zion Church in Spring City, Tennessee. She's a Knoxville native, is married, has adult children, and has wonderfully lovely grandchildren. Patty Ireland is an associate professor of English at the Strawberry Plains campus, specializing in Southern and African American literature with a concentration in creative writing. Patty is a published poetry short story writer, songwriter, and jingle composer. Prior to teaching college, she was a marketing director for a Los Angeles recording studio, a session singer in Nashville, and a vocal and stage performance coach. Currently, she is at work on a memoir about growing up in East Ridge, Tennessee in the 1960s. Uh, thank you all again to all of you. I do sincerely appreciate the time that you've given to this. And now I am going to turn things over to our guest, Dr. Green. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Dean Norris, and thanks to all of Pellissippi State for inviting me to come in. I'm honored and pleased to share this hour with two of your professors, and I wanted to give you an overview of how it was going to work. Um, we're each going to take the stage for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, to share our thoughts and speculations about this Appalachia story and our own place in it. And then we're going to have about 20 minutes together where we are going to, we've made some questions from the excellent questions that all the students have asked, and we're going to be thinking about those too. Well, let me start my PowerPoint, uh, which I will keep us company as I talk. Um, for folks who are interested, you can probably slide over your screen if you want to see half of my face along with it. So Bria's Appalachian Center started about 51 years ago uh, with a mission akin to Pellissippi's Appalachian Heritage Project. They both seem to create a community meeting space 
uh, and storehouse dedicated to regional literature and history where community members and the college could come together and learn about the Appalachian region. For me, the goal of both centers comes down to one phrase, one goal, the sharing, understanding, passing on, and creation of story. Uh, if you think back to your childhood or maybe the last Thanksgiving you had with friends or family, you might recall a favorite story that is always shared around the table by an elder. Or maybe you get to thinking and talking about the last movies you have seen or the last Netflix thing that's going on. Or maybe you have a tradition like we do in our family to watch Charlie Brown, Chris, uh, to watch Charlie Brown Christmas or the Elf every year. But one of my favorite stories that I grew up with, I would get this book every time I went to the library was how Drufus the dragon lost his head, which is, as you might guess, a book all about how a mean, tough dragon learns to love bunnies and take care of lambs. But tied up with that for me is also how my dad used to read it to me all the time and how my mother made a dragon too. And I took to bed and slept with so long. So what I'm saying here is that stories live in our hearts and our hearts live in stories. Now, story is a big, big word that includes a lot of things. Um, so it includes regional literature, history and folklore. It also has rooms though for conversations, music, movies and film, oral histories and interviews, podcasts and radio. What I'm saying is that it's my profound hope that by encountering the trove of materials and stories in your classes and in places like the Appalachian Heritage Project, that soon you'll begin to see how story is living just everywhere. Bumper stickers, billboards, street names, t-shirts, term papers. But realizing you're surrounded by stories is just the start. The next step, I think, is talking to each other about stories because that's when people start sharing their ideas, their own stories, and when people start doing that, that's when things get juicy. Now, it might not feel that way when your professor hands you a novel and assigns reading, but when she rolls up her sleeves and starts asking questions to get everyone talking, sharing, ah, that's when things really get going. The best part is when you see not only how stories work in the world, but you come to understand how your own story and the stories of people and places that you know also create the world as well. So here's a story I would like to share, my own. When I was a senior in high school in Lexington, Kentucky, I was in my senior AP class, and I asked my teacher who had recently, she recently had passed away, so I miss her, uh, why we didn't study anything by Kentucky authors. Now, my teacher would sit at the front of the classroom and she stood behind a podium uh, on, a, on a stool and she sat there and she leaned over and proclaimed, there are no great writers from Kentucky. I loved her, she was so wonderful. Now, I wasn't so certain where the good writers were, but I know they weren't me and my friends, although you know we were writing poems. So proving that teacher wrong is one of the reasons I became dedicated to local and regional literature and stories, how they work in communities, how they sustain people and how people create them. Now, as a writer and as a scholar, my own specialty is poetry. But as an educator, I'm committed to helping people see how deeply a story is part of them and how to help them start telling their own stories with me via writing, everything I can do to help them. Um, but when I started as a professor, I had to overcome a big problem first. See, my specialty was Appalachian literature. What is Appalachian? Um, by the way, that is a dinosaur that people don't know whether or not exist. Um, Appalachia, it's a word that's everywhere. It's in mountains from Georgia to Maine. Uh, where exactly is the state of Appalachia? Where does it start? Where it is it in? And for that matter, who is exactly Appalachian? Appalachia is also a word that carries a lot of baggage. I mean, it drags it around. So bag after bag. Well, look, here's a bag. I open it. Look. There's the head of Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. Oh, and here's another one about moon shining. Oh, got another bag about coal. And yeah, there's that big bag about poverty. In other words, a lot of stereotypical thinking about the region often carries exclusive assumptions about it. 
Yet I know from my 31 years of teaching about the region and teaching students that all students, no matter what their religion, ethnicity, race, nationality, where they grew up, genders or sexualities, can all be liberated by that word as well. And what you're seeing here is, this is the 50th anniversary of Dolly's Coat of Many Colors song, uh, which is just a fabulous song. And so what we did is we created a coat and we had our students at Bria color in squares about where their hearts were from. So we had students from Africa, students, lots of students from Tennessee. We have about 110 students from Tennessee here. Um, and what you see there is Berea coats of many color. And for me, that's what Appalachia is. So it's not one place or another, but it includes every story, rock, person, town, collar, and tree in the area. Now, I wanna give you some examples of how some of the stories have helped people, my students, to create in the past. Uh, I was working with students from Sevier County uh, uh, a couple of years ago and we have been studying Appalachian documentary photography, but her final project was a series of her own story of where she was from and what it meant to her and how, uh, including all of its love. And there was a lot of love from what she had, and where she went. She went to the country music concert with her mom, by the way. And there's also a lot of pain because things were changing. Believe me, Sevierville is something that um, is something she was not happy about as much as she loved where she was. Now I'm happy to share she's finishing up her PhD in animal science at the University of Kentucky. So go Sarah. Or this last summer, I was teaching a class called Appalachian Cultures, where we studied, for instance, African American stories from Tennessee, including Knoxville and Greene County. We studied, also learned about how people of Hispanic heritage who are Hispanic in Morristown suffered the ice raid. And we talked about all that community there. So these are pictures from the New York Times story here about that raid. Um, and in my class, I had two students who were DACA students, um, deferred action arrival students who were Hispanic. Um, and one was from Bristol and the other was from Asheville. Um, and so they told their stories. They used the tools that we were learning in class and using in class to think about other people's stories to tell their own. And I think I know we were all stunned kind of by the end, both their beauty and sadness and joy that were in those stories. Okay, here's another example. Um, I used to teach literature in West Virginia, I, down there in the lower left-hand corner, a place called Marshall University. And what I did for my Appalachian literature class is this one year, we were reading a book by a West Virginia poet laureate, uh, an oral history about an African-American teacher from down at the bottom in McDowell County. Uh, and we were looking at a collection of photos and short interviews conducted in a region where people talked about, in one sentence, coal mining and ginseng, hunting and chemical spills, all at once. Now, the way I approached the class was to first share that not everything we were going to study in this class applied to everybody in the classroom. It was not their direct experience, but we all had a relationship to it. You cannot live in West Virginia and not have a relationship to chemicals, coal, and um, African Americans. You just can't. Everybody is connected with that too. Um, the next thing I did was to help students see how people from different backgrounds inhabited their particular place in Appalachia in different ways. So we read essays by Appalachian writers. And so there was this one Appalachian writer that we read that you all might have heard of, a woman named Nikki Giovanni, some connection in Knoxville where she grew up and uh, went back for high school there. Um, and Nikki Giovanni um, would come in and she told the story of her growing up and what it meant to her. She talked about how where she used to live um, was reformed, was made into a nicer historical looking district, right? And the black business district was really hurt now, um, turning into what we now call old city. Um, so I have my students write about places that matter to them, that are in their hearts. And I'll show you a happier version here. Here she is uh, a couple of years ago, um, putting up a, a sign about that place too. Um, so my students wrote about hunting. They wrote about soccer. One even wrote about a golf course that wrapped around two family cemeteries. Um, it was a really beautiful essay. And as, but as we continued our more academic reading and writing, students also revised their personal essays by focusing on their diction and they made their stories come to life with stories and images. And they revised those again and again until I think those stories shined as brightly to a reader as they did in the students' hearts. 
But at the end of the semester, I had a student break into tears. Uh, hold on, my. So um, the student grew up, as you can see, in rural West Virginia, uh, where her father was a. I uh, lost my place. Oh no. Um, a small rural town. He was a doctor in rural West Virginia, and she felt like she had never belonged. Well, the reason that she had never belonged is because her father was from India. She was Hindu and often felt excluded from the stories and histories of the events around her. And she felt honored and she, her tears were tears of joy for feeling like her story was worth putting up to the other West Virginia stories that we were reading because her heritage and her belonging was part of West Virginia. So yeah, the phrase Appalachian heritage can sometimes feel exclusive. Many stories have been part of Appalachia have been silenced or twisted or aren't part of the record. Well, here's the deal for you and me. It's up to us to set the record straight, up to you to learn from what others have done and to add your own stories to those you share about in the great big lovely grab bag I call Appalachia. Now, I couldn't do any of what I do without the support of amazing people the passionate, careful work of cultural creators, keepers, and curators, people like Tennessee's renowned state historian, Wilma Dykeman, North Georgia poets who grew up with sharecroppers, podcasts like Black and Appalachia out of Knoxville. But how do you find all those materials? Well, yes, welcome to the libraries. Welcome to your professors. These are the people who are working with you to create, to enable you to learn and create the stories that are around you. And so I thought I would actually stop, start, stop with one other slide. And when I put up, I was going to be presenting at Pellissippi State, um, a friend of mine, James Maples, who is a professor at the Eastern Kentucky University, he's like, I went to school there. And I just wanted everybody to know, here's the book he has coming out this year with West Virginia University Press about a place here in Kentucky. So stories are possible and in your hands. Well, okay, that's it for my time. I would now like to turn the stage over to Professor Dindy. And I will stop to my share. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, in sharing some of my experiences of being Appalachian and teaching, actually, I didn't know that I was Appalachian for a long time. Um, for us, for me and my family, we were simply Southern Black. Appalachia for me never made a connection because when I thought of Appalachia and what I saw about Appalachia was always white America. And it was always the poor white America in Kentucky, in Virginia, and I didn't really know that Appalachia was Appalachia here in East Tennessee until, you know, I was probably about 10 or 11. And we started seeing some of the um, news cast and they were asking for donations to help those in Appalachia, to help with Christmas or to help with school uh, materials and those kinds of things. So um, it didn't resonate that that was me that I was a part of Appalachia. And I think that that made an impact on um, what I do now, because in my teaching here at Pellissippi State, I want to be sure that I'm sharing that with our students, that we have a very diverse and very rich culture that we need to be a part of, we need to be learning about, and we need to be sharing. Um, so for me, Knowing that I was black and Southern um, and having a little bit of a draw because I'm from Knoxville, from East Tennessee. Well, of course, I, I knew that I wanted to teach since I was probably five years old, but there were some influential people and some influential books that actually led me into teaching. Um, as I said, I didn't see too many representations of me, of what I looked like, in media or anything else, but I do remember 
one of my favorite books was called The Snowy Day. And if you have ever read that, it was the only book at that time, back in the early 70s, that had a young black boy on the cover. He had on his red snowsuit and he went out and played. And I love that book. I read it over and over. I bought it for my grandchildren. Um, but that said to me, I have a place. We have a place. And so I try to share that place with others. My desire to be a teacher, I think, came out of um, some family members who were working in the school systems in different areas, but specifically from my high school years. I had a wonderful senior English teacher who introduced us to Shakespeare, and I fell in love with it. And being a Black person and admitting to loving Shakespeare didn't go over so well sometimes. Um, so I knew that I was different. And, and that led me into looking at education and looking at the literature that was available and knowing that I needed to share some of my loves with students and that I needed to learn even more. So I made it to Tennessee Tech University in Cookville. Had a wonderful time there. Um, got a great education there for both my bachelor's and my master's degrees, but I had an instructor um, as I was preparing to become a teacher, Dr. Eloise Jackson, and she insisted that I record myself as part of my pre-teaching um, activities. And it was an eye-opener because I sounded different than I thought I sounded. And that's been at something that she wanted me to be aware of, not necessarily to overcome it, but to be aware of. And so oftentimes people ask me, are you from Knoxville? And I say, yes, I am. And they say, no, you're not. I say, yes, I am, I'm from Knoxville. But we say Knoxville, so you can't be from Knoxville and you can't have grown up here. But I did, and, and that idea of being Southern and then leading into this discussion about being Appalachian um, makes an influence. It, it makes uh, a difference in how I deliver content. Um, Dr. Green was talking about story and about how everybody has a story. Um, my story comes from um, family and from church primarily. You know, that's what we did when I was younger. We went to church. We, we were in church for hours at a time. And I enjoyed it. Other people didn't so much, but I did. And, and in church, you heard different ways of communicating. You learned how to um, enunciate. You learned how to engage with your audience. You learned how to draw them in, or at least I did. And so that resonated with me. And that is translated into what I do today. Um, I think that my teaching shows that I care about the way that students learn and about what they learn. Um, in our reading program here, we primarily um, center our reading curriculum around a novel that our classes read. And I have, for the last two or three semesters, chosen novels that are historical fictions because I want them to hear a truth in a different way than they may have heard it their whole educational careers. We focus a lot on East Tennessee and on Native Americans. And we also focus a lot on Black America, African Americans. My bias comes through, of course. Um, but I think that's okay. And I think that that's beneficial to my students. Um, I want to, um, I guess, wrap up here. I'm, I'm not gonna use my full 10 minutes, but I wanna wrap up with saying that being a teacher at a community college, especially here in Knoxville, allows me to hear the different sounds that come from East Tennessee and Appalachia. Um, 
you don't just hear a Knoxville accent. You don't just hear a severe county accent. You hear a conglomeration of sounds. And that for me is very invigorating. It's very exciting. And it helps me to then, I think, connect to my students more. Um, I, t I tease them sometimes about their East Tennessee draws um, and I allow them to be who they are, but gentle correction I think is also important because again, the, the first inkling that I had of Appalachia was a real stereotype. You know, people who were hillbillies, who weren't quite bright and who were always white. And we don't want that to be the image that people carry any longer. So I'm thankful that I get a chance to do what I do here at Pellissippi State. And I'm really thankful that um, Dr. Green has partnered with us for this Appalachia Speaks. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Professor Ireland now. Well, thank you so much, Professor Dindy. I am really honored uh, to be part of this event today. And I wanna spend my time sharing my own Appalachian story with you. So as my students know, my hometown is Eastridge, Tennessee, the biggest little town in the world and a place that I sarcastically referred to as a teenager as the armpit of the redneck world. Um, it's situated right on the Tennessee Georgia line near Chattanooga. So I don't know that all the experts would agree that it's geographically technically part of Appalachia but it certainly embodies all the nuances of Appalachia. I tell my students that you have to say it like this, East Ridge, cause that's how we talk in East Ridge. So there's one main drag. And as you can imagine, there's pretty much a church on every street corner. There are some interesting landmarks, for example, the Purdy Do Beauty Shop. And I kid you not, it's P-U-R-D-Y Do. Um, and I can promise you, if you go into the Purdy Do and allow them to touch your hair, when you come out, you will look quite different. You may not, in your own estimation, be very pretty, but you will have a new look. There is also the Party Mart, and there's a sign out front that reads, Party Mart, stop where pleasure starts. And so when you go into the Party Mart, you can get your beer, and oddly enough, you can also pick up a free Bible. There was always a little sign in the window, free Bibles. So when you emerged from the party mart with your beer in one hand and your Bible in the other, you were pretty much equipped to tackle any and all challenges that might arise for you as a citizen of East Ridge. So in short, East Ridge was like a microcosm of all of these strange paradoxes that are Appalachia. And in addition, my dad, who had a huge impact on my life, did come from a long line of ancestors who inhabited the hill country of East Tennessee. Um, and so he brought all of the richness of that culture into our home. I grew up against the backdrop of the turbulent 1960s. So the civil rights movement, uh, the marches, the racism, the violence. And so I developed a love-hate relationship with my place of origin. And as a teenager, my one goal was to get out of East Ridge, which I eventually did. But over the years, I've come full circle. I've been able to embrace my place of origin, warts and all. And I have chronicled that journey, that struggle through writing a memoir called East Ridge as Eden. I'm almost done with it and it's been quite healing for me. But in the book, I talk a lot about my dad. Daddy was the wisest man I ever knew, but he just barely had a fifth grade education. He was a child of the Great Depression. And during the beginning of that fifth grade year, his own father developed a mental illness. And when he became dangerously ill, he was sent here to Knoxville to Lions View, a place known at the time as the Insane Asylum where he lived out the remainder of his years. Daddy's mother was a severe diabetic. He had two little sisters. And so at the beginning of fifth grade, when all of this went down, he quit school and he went to work doing whatever a kid could find to do. And by this time, the family had moved to Chattanooga. So daddy became a newspaper boy, selling newspapers out on the street corner. 
When there would be a lull, he would sit down on the curb and read the only thing available to him other than the Bible back at home, and that was that newspaper. There was a kindly police officer who patrolled that area and befriended Daddy. And so when Daddy would encounter a word that he did not understand or know how to pronounce, he would ask that police officer to help him. And this was how he tried to continue to learn. He was virtuous, he was honest to a fault, he was practical but poetic in his own way. And he was full of all of the goodness we imagine when we envision uh, Appalachia. He always called me by the nickname of Tug, mimicking my lack of ability to pronounce Shug, which was his real nickname for me. He was one of the few white men in East Ridge who voted for JFK and was proud and who would actually sit down and listen to Dr. King's speeches. And in fact, I distinctly remember walking in our little living room one day, <clears throat> seeing dad sitting in his chair, just glued to the screen. And there was Dr. King on our black and white screen, making what was to become his most famous speech. And he said, I have a dream. I have a dream today. And then he went on to expound on his vision of that dream. Now, Daddy certainly didn't understand some of the big words that Dr. King was using, but he got the gist of the message. And as I looked over at him, I could see little pearls of tears in, in his eyes. Daddy was not a man who cried easily, but those words made him cry. And yet Daddy, too, was guilty of embodying those strange contradictions that we see in Appalachia. So in his case, it was naivete and ignorance just set right down in the middle of complexity and curiosity and compassion. So for example, until I was 10 years old, he would sometimes use the N word in our house. And yet ironically, he did not seem to grasp its impact or its offensiveness. And I suspect that's because his parents and their parents before then and on and on used it in daily conversation. And also with daddy's lack of formal education, with his lack of exposure to diversity, I learned that he literally believed that this word derived uh, from Nigeria and it referred to anyone whose ancestors came from Nigeria and that was a word he mispronounced. But you know, as the great Maya Angelou once said, when you learn better, you do better. And one rainy Good Friday on the Easter weekend of my 10th year, Daddy learned better as we had been dying Easter eggs. And later on, he learned better to the degree that we were thrown out of a church we were attending because he had the courage to stand up and confront two deacons who turned out to be Klansmen. And after that, he learned well enough that he came to the defense of an elderly Black lady on a bus one day as some young, strong, healthy white men were trying to force her out of her seat. So as I close today, I want to share those moments with you from that rainy Good Friday afternoon as they appear in East Ridges Eden. Why does it have to rain on Easter weekend? I asked Daddy as we began dyeing the eggs for what was sure to be an indoor hunt that year. Well, to God must be especially sad with us this year probably cause of the hard time the N-words is having down in Mississippi and Alabama. I looked at him wide-eyed. Why would he be sad with us over them, the Negroes, having a hard time, I asked. Because it's our fault. Why? Because we didn't treat them like people. We treated them worse than animals. When we, did we do that, I asked. I don't remember anything about it. Well, too, we might not have done it personally, you and me, but white people done it for years, making them slaves, talking down to them. And then once they were so-called free, we didn't really set them free at all because we kept right on not treating them like people. Then see, they tried to march with Martin Luther to make us see the truth, but it ain't worked yet because we sit dogs on them and spray them with water hoses and lock them up in jail. They can't trust us. And all because somebody's skin looks darker, it don't make no sense to me. Well, if all that's true, Daddy, I ask, then why do you call them a bad word like the N-word? Daddy put the vinegar bottle down for a long minute and looked intently out the window at the rain falling harder now. Finally, he said, I don't know. I reckon because my mom and daddy done it and didn't think nothing of it and because I thought it had something to do with where they come from somewhere over the ocean. Does it hurt their feelings, you think? Yes, sir, I do, I said. 
well too. That's another good reason God's sad, I guess, and his tears is falling down from the windows of heaven. Daddy stared out the window at the darkening sky for a moment as distant thunder rolled softly toward the east. Of course, it always rains somewhere in the world on Good Friday, he said. It does, I asked. Mm-hmm. Why? Because that was the day the Lord died. So God sends his tears down on the world on that day every year to remind us not to get so full of ourselves. In fact, I reckon I just got reminded. So this is my Appalachian story. It is the reason that I write. It is why I became a teacher because these stories are in us. They are us. They are flowing in our veins. They are pungent in our night sweats. And I want to help other people tell their stories as well as have the courage to tell my own. Sometimes it's a disagreeable truth that forces this love-hate relationship that we have with our birthplaces, with our Edens. And we might need to leave every now and then to go off far away somewhere and make a new life for ourselves. We might need to think and read and reflect and write and grapple and look back at our Edens from the great safe distance of time and memory. But in the end, it's who we are and it's home. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it back now to Dr. North. Thank you, Professor Arlen. And a a brief thank you to all of our speakers, and I will get to a larger thank you when we wrap up. But uh, what we'll do now is introduce the question and answer part of the webinar. Uh, and also a quick thank you to the students for participating. We've got students here from uh, Professor Dendy's class, uh, Professor Ireland's English class, uh, and also students from Professor Ireland's Young Creative Writers uh, workshop and club that uh, brainstormed these questions. Uh, I need a hand. Would you like me to read the questions or do you have them and are going to read them and then respond? If you could read them to us just to get us started, that'd be great. Got it. I'll read the first question. Uh, Chris, this will be yours to answer first and then Patty and Candace can uh, step in. Um, could you share your thoughts about the history of the region's settlement and how we see that being portrayed, turned into stories and spoken about. Thank you. And um, before I get started, I just wanna say that I hope, I don't know how you all felt listening to uh, Professor Ireland's and Professor Dindy's stories, but I, my heart was, my heart is bigger now than it was before. <laughs> just it is bigger now. Um, this is a big question, right? Because students, we're all curious about where people came from and how something started. Uh, when I was a young boy here in Kentucky, I, in second grade, I went to the Fort Boonesboro with Daniel Boone, and there was such pride about Daniel Boone, there is such pride here. Um, well, that turned out that was the first year that that state place was opened, and since then, we've learned a lot more, um, and there's been a lot more talk about uh, the settlers coming in and habitation and conflict with the Native Americans. Um, more than just conflict about slaves that people had. And so now people are doing work all over to, to rephrase and re-understand. You know, there's some challenges as uh, uh, Professor Ireland was talking about, how do we talk about the good and the bad? Um, and the way I talk about that is, if you wanna talk about your ancestors, then you gotta talk about both. You just can't be proud of the good stuff. Um, it doesn't mean you condemn them, it means you've got to think about it, though, and think about, well, why it was happening, too, um, and maybe figure out how to forgive and do work. Um, also, now, to help other people understand both the pain and the joy and to include everybody in the conversation. So I think that's the big work that's going on. Um, but, uh, Patty, what do you, uh, Dr. Professor Ireland, what do you think? So um, I was sharing this story with Dr. Green and Professor Dendy in one of our earlier uh, conversations, another story about my dad that sort of encapsulates my feeling about this question pretty well. Uh, so, so Daddy had a lot of pride in his Appalachian heritage and um, he would often go off on a tangent about it and, and he would say things like, um, where there's a will, there's a way and where there's a will and a way, there's a Parker. Our ancestors plowed this land, they settled this land, they planted this land, and they fought those Indians. And one day he was in the middle of 
one of those tangents and his right eyebrow went up and that that was always a sign that uh, he was about to say something profound or that he had had sort of an epiphany moment. And he said, and the rest of our ancestors were the Indians, like, whoa. And in that moment, you know, I, I realized because his mother was half Cherokee, that indeed we were walking around with this mixture in our blood. Again, that, that paradox, you know, of the original indigenous people and the blood of the people who came from across the ocean, because many of them had suffered prejudice and they were coming to find a new life. And then ironically, they are prejudiced against the people whom they encounter when they get here. Um, and we're a mixture of all of those things. Um, and I certainly saw that tension, you know, not just with Native Americans, but with African Americans, as I mentioned, and even with Jewish Americans. I remember that there, there was one Jewish boy in our elementary school growing up. And he, I was so impressed with him because he was so curious and so bright. And he knew more about the Old Testament than any of us knew, even the Bible teacher. Yet he was bullied, he was beaten up one day and his family eventually left the area because they didn't want to put him through all of that. So I think we have to, as Dr. Green says, get to the heart of the matter, we have to accept the truth of, of our history that there's been a great deal uh, uh, that, that we, we ought to examine and that we ought to be ashamed of, but there are still the good parts of Appalachia, the good stories that give us hope for change. Professor Dendy? Thank you, Professor Allen. Um, I agree so much with what you've said about we need to know our history, not necessarily be condemned or ashamed about it, but know it so that we can then begin to make changes. Um, as I said, I never really considered Appalachia as part of where I was from, but I do recall that and this is after listening to some of the podcasts, especially the Black and Appalachia pop podcast, um, that a lot of our people here, uh, especially my family, they're from Opelika, Alabama. And my grandfather uh, worked in coal. He wasn't in the mines, but I remember him delivering coal to the houses, to the people in our little community in Dainty, where we lived. Um, and other parts of, of Knoxville. And it was interesting to me that a lot of the um, black families from Alabama and Mississippi migrated to Kentucky and Virginia because of the coal industry, because they were able to find jobs, because they were able to prosper their families. Of course, it led to other issues, health issues, early deaths, um, but it did give them a, a way to maybe rise above, to become um, entrepreneurial, to better their families, to better their standing, especially as black men, because of course, I grew up in the seventies. Um, racism was over, but not really, you know, and segregation had happened, but there was still, it was still very evident that there were some places Black people, African-Americans weren't welcomed in, in the city of Knoxville and surrounding areas. And you knew that there were places that you should get out of before night came. Um, and, and that had an impact on me because it, it made me wonder why do people put so much emphasis on my skin color? As a little girl, I had never ever heard the N word until I was in school. And my dad tells the story of how I came home one day crying because somebody had called me that. And I didn't know what it meant, but I knew it felt bad. It felt terrible. And so he explained that to me. And, and I, I had never heard that well because we were very, I guess, segregated actually in our little community out in Dainey. There were white families, 
there, but it wasn't a lot of them. And it, it was family and it was friends and it was church. And so um, knowing that part of my history made me proud to be a little black girl. Um, and it made me stronger, I think, as I went through middle school and high school. And oftentimes I was the only black child in my class or in my classes. Um, I can remember high school, it was me and my cousins and maybe two other families of black families. Um, and it, it was difficult to try to figure out where do you fit in? How do you navigate this thing called education when on one hand, you're told that you're not black enough. And on the other hand, you're told um, you're acting white because you like school, because you enjoy it, because you, <laughs> you want to be there. Um, and, and those things in, ingrained themselves in me, but they also pushed me. And my job, what I, what I strive to do with my students is to let them know some of my experiences and to open their eyes. Because in today's world, our students are almost colorblind, you might say, to some extent, you know, um, which is great, but they have to know the history. They have to understand why um, there was that kind of prejudice and that kind of hatred and that kind of nastiness. And they have to understand I think their parents' points of view and their grandparents' points of views. And I, I'm, I'm sad that I didn't get a chance to sit at the knees of my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles and hear their stories. And that's because I was a kid, I didn't wanna hear that. Um, and also because they were busy, they were working and, and they didn't have time to have a storybook setting. But I think that's the one thing that I miss. And that's the one thing, that's the reason that I use historical text as often as I can, because I want to hear the stories. The stories matter. Um, even if the stories are difficult, even if they are um, full of emotion, they matter and they need to be heard. And so we have to challenge our students, I think, in that way. Um, we have to be reminded that music is a big part of our history as well. Dr. Uh, Professor Ireland, um, she herself is a songwriter and a singer. I'm a singer. And the, the music that I know best is the music from the church. And that's part of my history. And I share that as often as I can. The hymns, the, the, the slave songs, the freedom songs, the chants, the choral selections, that I remember from childhood where someone would call out or line the hymn and then the, the congregation would sing it in a very mournful, very spiritual way. That is comfort for me. And I think that's comfort for a lot of people who had that same experience, whether black or white, because I do remember going to some um, fundamentally white Baptist churches when I was younger, I had a few friends and I went to church with them. They had the same hymns, didn't have the, quite the flavor that we had, but it was the same hymn. It had the same spirituality to it. And so from that, I understood we are connected. Me with my very brown skin is connected to my friend who has peach colored skin, as my granddaughter used to say. And that connection is important. The history of this region is important. And as often as we can share it, we should and embrace it. Dr. Green. Well, well I think that um, this gets into kind of the next question that we were gonna think about here. Um, and that is this tension between stereotypes in Appalachia and the reality that, that people live. Um, and uh, Professor Dindy, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about the Clinton 12 
Um, and most people don't know about the Clinton 12 because it's that's the they're the first people Clinton actually integrated in schools before anywhere else in the nation. And this is a real wow, that's just incredible. And they're, they're, the big thing about that is that there was no problem. Everybody said, OK, let's do this. It was the national white radicals that came in from outside and talked about it. Um, so I really encourage all of the um, uh, folks that if they've not been up to uh, the Clinton, I don't remember the name of the memorial place, uh, talking about it, but there's a really great documentary too. And so when we're posed with this, well, there's, I hear this and we hear the realities, I think it's also a matter then of rolling up our sleeves and talking to people and listening and doing the work to find out, well, what are the truths? The, the good with the bad there too. Um, I think about tradition. Tradition is never tradition. Tradition is always being reinvented. It's always being remade. It's always being reshaped. Um, but we can only learn it too from the people who have been there. So um, for instance, I talked to a man, um, last name of Holt, uh, David Holt. Um, and he's an amazing bluegrass person. He was from, um, I almost said Missouri. Minnesota is where he was from, you know, but when he heard about the great musicians in Appalachia, he came to learn from them. And now he is a carrier of the tradition and moving it on too with it as well. Um, and traditions, as we know, change and they're varied as well. Uh, so I encourage people uh, as they are thinking about what they, what they see in an image, no more than we can leave a commercial Right. People always, we're always boiling down things to basics. That's how our minds work, right? Our minds are just, we just boil it down and we miss the complexities. We miss the risk. The trick is to ask people and to go and to learn how to find it out. And the internet is a good start, but it is not the only way and it is not enough. You need people and you need researchers, you need librarians, you need people to work with because we're all in this together to figure out how the overlap of our realities and what we hear work on too. Dr. Uh, Professor Ireland, what do you think? So I absolutely agree, uh, Dr. Green. And, and to me, you know, again, I keep going back to these paradoxes. To me, the truth about the tension between the stereotypes and the realities of Appalachia are, are really found in those um, beautiful, odd, impossible, richly human paradoxes. Um, and so, for example, you know, if you were to be on the main drag in East Ridge at this moment, you would see what would appear to be those walking, talking, living, breathing stereotypes going down the street. You would see the little old blue haired lady who plays the organ at church and who just will gossip about you behind your back and then bake you a pie. And you'll see the redneck with his mullet and, and he's driving his pickup and his rebel flags flying from the back. And yet somehow he can say please and thank you and no ma'am and yes sir, uh, when he addresses people and you're like, what is going on here? So I think digging into those paradoxes is part of the answer. Um, I think a lot about my Sunday school teacher and her name was Ms. Barbara Bishop. She was a middle-aged lady who had never been married. And, and the talk around town was that she had never had a date, in fact. But there was also a rumor that she wrote poetry. And I was quite intrigued with that because I thought that poets must be people like me who like to question. And I would nearly drive Miss Barbara crazy with all of my questions in Sunday school, like, really, how did God get two of every animal in the world in that one boat? And so I'm punished now because Eve ate an apple one day and all Jews are going to hell, yet Jesus is a Jew and we worship him. And she would always have the same answer. She'd say, now, Patty, the Lord don't appreciate your questions. But one day during the Christmas pageant, which Miss Barbara always directed every year, um, a piece of paper fell out of her big bag that she carried and me being the nosy kid that I was I of course uh, grabbed it and and read it and discovered that it was a poem that Miss Barbara had written and to my great surprise it was a very deep poem and it was about the idea that she had never known romance 
the speaker in the poem had never known love. And the speaker was questioning God as to why this would be the case. And I remember thinking, aha, Miss Barbara does ask questions. She just didn't want any of us to know it. So I think, you know, there's so much more underneath uh, those, those stereotypes um, that we need to dig into. And uh, to me, that's where the, the really interesting parts of it lie. Um, and so Professor Dindy, um, what do you think about the, those tensions between the stereotypes and the realities of Appalachia? I think that you and Dr. Green are spot on. The tensions are real and there's no sense in us trying to pretend that they are not. Um, but the tensions can be overcome through education. I don't mean you have to go to a classroom. You have to sit and lecture. No, I mean, read, pick up a book, read a poem, listen to people, have conversations with people who don't look like you, who don't sound like you, who don't come from your same neighborhood and honestly hear what they say. You're going to hear some things that might offend you, yes, but you're probably going to hear more that connects you. That's what I found. And even though I'm not a person who would just start a conversation with anyone, I'm willing to share. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a person who would just tell my whole life story, but I'm willing to share for a few moments and hear and learn and grow. I, I really am convinced that the only way that we're going to alleviate a lot of the tension is to talk and listen. And, and listening might be through a podcast. It might be in open conversation. It might be in a classroom. It might just be listening to your friend or to a person that you're sitting next to who might become your friend. Um, I, I would really, encourage all of us to find a good book, um, a narrative about Appalachia, about our cultures and about our heritages, and find good books about someone else's culture and heritage. That's the only way that we're really going to overcome a lot of the tensions and dismantle the stereotypes. And they definitely need to be dismantled, right? <laughs> So that's my answer. Dr. Green, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we're near the end of our time. And uh, I really appreciate all that has been said and being part of this conversation. And I want to turn it over to Dean North for some closing words, I think. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone. This has been a wonderful hour. I wish we had another hour because the questions have been fantastic. The answers have been uh, so insightful uh, and, and the presentations were, were so good. Um, I would like to put in, before I say my thank you is a quick plug, it's the Green McAdoo Cultural Center, Dr. Green, that's up in Clinton, Tennessee. And uh, we, before the pandemic, were able to take a trip up there about three years in a row and we'll be, I think, returning uh, for a trip uh, in, in the spring. I look forward to being able to do that again. We make a point to get our students out. I have some thank yous to say, and of course I will start with Dr. Green. Thank you so much for your time. Professors Ireland and Dendy, thank you for your presentations. I sincerely appreciate it. Um, I've got to thank uh, Susan Martell for her ideas and contributions and her hard work on obtaining the grant and the time that she spent I cannot wait to see a new library, hopefully within the year here at this campus. It will be a wonderful addition to the building. Uh, Mary Ellen Spencer, also thank you. I hope you're in attendance and thank you for your work and time uh, on this project and also for helping uh, bring life back into this campus. It's been wonderful to see us back and I look forward to growing from here. A thank you to Event Services for your time and efforts for making this happen. Anissa Rowland and the Foundation, and Allison McKittrick. Allison, you have done so much wonderful work to make this happen. And I, I believe that you're now in your uh, 
going into maybe your second or third month of this position. So pretty good, really, really good. And not just a great start, you've hit the ground running. Um, at the end, I, though, I am gonna thank our students. Thank you for attending. And uh, my thoughts go out to you. I look forward to seeing you back on campus. Zoom and Teams is a wonderful tool in the toolbox, but I really love the interaction here. And uh, that's what we need. And I encourage you to continue to attend events like this. And I hope to see all of you when we have our opening uh, at the, uh, the library here on the campus. Um, so thank you again, this has been wonderful. And thank you to our participants, folks that have been able to attend today. Thank you very much. I think that wraps us up. And if folks have things to get onto during their day, have a wonderful day.